Listening to The Bridge Busters, The First Dam Busters, and The Race to Save Britain by Mark Felton, published by Mandalay Books and narrated by Mark Felton. Chapter 2 The Winter of Discontent. Okay, Skipper, crackled the reassuring voice of Ellis Ross's navigator in his headset as his overladen bomber struggled for altitude over the blacked out city of Lincoln. Course 080 degrees magnetic, speed 160. Roger, navigator, replied Ross, repeating the course and speed, his eyes focused on the glowing instrument panel in front of him and on the horizon, which was rapidly fading to blackness as the last of the sun sank from sight. The plane banked slightly, and Ross, a hand on the two engine throttles, tucked his Hamden into formation with his two comrades. The three flights of Hamden bombers, carrying full bomb loads, lumbered sluggishly out towards the enemy coast beyond the North Sea, their powerful engines drowning out all other sounds aboard the aircraft. The pilots and crews temporarily forgot their nerves, their training, and the busy routine aboard the planes, diverting them from contemplating any potential horrors that lay ahead. Moving about their cramped positions, in flying helmets, goggles, and tan-coloured flight suits, deflated yellow May West life jackets on their chests, and parachute harnesses about their waists and crotches, the pilots concentrated on their instruments and fields of vision, while the navigators fumbled with compasses, maps, pencils, and stopwatches, and the two gunners checked and rechecked their weapons and scanned the darkening skies. Everyone levelled off at a thousand feet. Ahead lay only the black enemy coast, with its flak, searchlights, and roving night fighters. Aboard the 49 Squadron flight of three aircraft, under squadron leader Lowell, problems started as the Hamdens headed into cloud formations and choppy air over the North Sea. The ride was uncomfortable, the turbulence knocking the crews against metal fixtures and fittings, the navigators struggling to annotate their maps on vibrating tables with shaking pencils. Soon, the chop and darkness made keeping formation nearly impossible, and aboard Pinocchio, Babe Leroy kept losing visual sight of Lerwill's aircraft. A talented amateur artist, Leroy had painted the Disney character below his cockpit. Lowell was aware of Leroy's problem, so he would periodically order his wireless operator to flash a large oldest lamp out of the upper gun position, but the effect of a piercing white light in the darkness was to temporarily blind Leroy, so that fearful of a collision he would break formation and wait for his eyes to adjust before frustratingly starting the process all over again. The pilot of the third aircraft, Sergeant Pratt, had never even landed a Hamden at night and was worrying about the return journey, should he even survive the outward leg, while Lerwell and Leroy only had thirty hours night-flying experience each. They pressed on grimly. Wing Commander Snaith and his fellow 83 Squadron pilots failed to find the German pocket battleships said to be in the Schillig Roads, and after realising the futility of continuing, Snaith abruptly aborted the mission. Battling high winds and rain squalls, they were lucky to get home to Scampton in the early hours of the 4th of September, still in one piece. Joe Collier had been relieved when Snaith had signalled to the aircraft to jettison their bombs and turn for home, and it was a feeling shared by almost everyone on the mission. Lerwill, Leroy, and Pratt also broke off their raid to Wilhelmshaven due to the adverse weather and navigational problems and limped home through the squally skies. So, the first raid of the war ended with abject failure for the RAF. They saw no German ships and only managed to bomb the empty ocean. But it wasn't the fault of the pilots. They had not been given the right tools or received sufficient training to do the job in the first place. Bomber Command began the Second World War far too small, with the wrong aircraft and with some serious gaps in its training program, 
and these problems had all been highlighted by the almost farcical attempts to attack German ships on the 3rd of September 1939. Bomber Command's aircraft, the Vickers Wellington, Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, and Handley Page Hamden were designed as tactical support bombers, lacking the range and ordnance capability for anything more ambitious than a very limited strategic offensive. Bomber Command also lacked the technology to accurately bomb by day, let alone by night or in bad weather, having refused to incorporate radio and radar-derived navigational aids in the run-up to hostilities. This meant that over the coming months, the squadrons seldom hit their targets accurately or even inaccurately. The behaviour of Britain's supposed allies didn't make Bomber Command's job any easier. The French categorically refused to allow RAF bombers to attack targets inside Germany from French airfields, terrified of provoking the Germans into retaliatory raids on France. The Belgians and Dutch were resolutely neutral and refused to allow British aircraft to overfly their airspace to get to targets inside Germany. This left Bomber Command with little choice but to attack German shipping along the North Sea coast from bases around the Wash and in East Anglia. An aerial campaign developed that became known as the Battle of the Heligoland Bight, and it had two outcomes for the RAF. Firstly, the squadrons sent across the North Sea largely failed to hit anything, and secondly, German fighters massacred the poorly armed bombers. On the 14th of December 1939, number 99 squadron lost six out of the 12 Wellingtons it sent to attack German cruisers, while on the 18th of December, the Luftwaffe shot down 12 out of the 24 Wellingtons that made another attempt to bond shipping off Wilhelmshaven and in the Schillig roads. These tragedies were nothing short of massacres. It was the same across the different aircraft types. The crew and aircraft losses were soon crippling Bomber Command's ability to prosecute the war against Germany. In many cases, the raids were reserved for leaflet-dropping sorties, an operation codenamed Nickel. Braving flak and night fighters, British bombers penetrated German airspace simply to drop millions of propaganda leaflets that urged the German people to overthrow Hitler, an unlikely proposition with the Germans riding high on victory. Air Vice Marshal Arthur Harris, who would take command of five group in Lincolnshire, was highly dismissive of the value of such raids, remarking that such an effort was only providing the Germans with enough toilet paper to last the war. The only advantage that was extracted from the nickel sorties was plenty of much-needed night flying practice for the bomber crews over Germany, but at some cost in lives and planes. But for now at least, with rules of engagement that forbade attacks on the German mainland, Bomber Command could do little else to help the war effort. For the crews, one dangerous but ultimately disappointing raid followed the last, and the effect on morale was dramatic. Wake up, sir! shouted a voice on the other side of Pilot Officer Lawrence Dean's door. You're required at flights for immediate takeoff. Dean had been asleep when an NCO hammered on his door at 6.30am on the 21st of December 1939 and roused him rudely from his bed. New to his squadron and barely out of his teens, Dean realised that a big flap was on. Once he reached the briefing room, all was revealed. The German pocket battleship Deutschland was reported to be, at that very moment, steaming majestically up the west coast of Norway, a perfect target for the Hamdens of 49 and 83 squadrons. This would be Dean's first operational sortie. The young officer grabbed his flying kit and, unshaven and unfed, ran over to the hangar to board his Hamden as navigator. No one gave him any proper maps. They would simply fly to Norway, we shouldn't be too hard to miss, and locate the warship and her escorts. Nine aircraft from 83 Squadron were included in the show. Joe Collier replaced Guy Gibson for this raid, and Gibson was left fuming on the ground. Later, he would count himself lucky to have been left out. 
Numbers 49 and 83 squadrons were to attack the Deutschland in company with another Hamden squadron, number 50, flying out of RAF Waddington. To aid ship identification, the leading 49 squadron aircraft also carried a naval officer. The planes were soon airborne and hammering across the North Sea, bent on destruction. Enemy coast ahead, Joe Collier's navigator announced over the RT a few hours later. The 83, 49 and 50 squadron Hamdens droned on towards what they took to be Norway. Collier strained his eyes as the coastline started to resolve itself several miles ahead, but the view was frequently obscured by flurries of snow that lashed against the windscreen. Collier and the other pilots would stiffen in their seats when the snow enveloped their aircraft, conscious of the danger of collision in these frequent and frightening whiteouts. They went immediately to their instruments and flew blind until the whiteness suddenly evaporated, revealing the coastline once more dead ahead. Skipper, this doesn't look right, came another call from Collier's navigator in the aircraft's nose. That's not Norway. Unable to use the wireless to talk to the surrounding aircraft due to security concerns that the Germans might be able to listen in, Collier and the other pilots watched for the bombing leader to change course. He's turning north, Collier said, as the leading aircraft in the formation banked to port. The following aircraft all turned gently with him. The formation had made landfall in Denmark. The bomb-laden aircraft followed the coast of neutral Sweden to Norway without spotting any battleships. At 60 degrees north, the formation banked west towards home and immediately plunged into a gale-force wind that threatened to scatter the aircraft. The 83 Squadron Hamden started to experience problems on the return leg of the journey. It was obvious that their leader had lost his way and was leading the planes far to the north. There was a fear that they might simply fly past the northern tip of Scotland and out into the endless wastes of the Atlantic. The leader's aircraft also concerned Collier and the other pilots. His landing gear kept extending and retracting. He kept losing his speed as his undercarriage tended to come down, with great changes on his airspeed every time it went up and down, said Collier. Confidence in their leader plummeted. Aboard pilot officer Dean's aircraft, the crew was anxious to see the English coast, and the pilot was growing very nervous. The two gunners were frozen in their open positions, the temperature well below zero, ice growing inside the plane. The aircraft was slowed considerably by a fierce headwind, causing the whole formation to fall behind schedule, and the 83 Squadron's leading aircraft was holding everyone up. The pilot, exhausted after hours glued to his seat, glanced constantly at his fuel gauges. If land didn't appear soon, they would all be going for an unpleasant and possibly terminal swim in the freezing black water below. Eventually, a small fishing boat was seen. The naval officer aboard the leader's aircraft believed that they were off the north coast of Scotland, and his planes circled the fishing boat, whose skipper helpfully pointed to land as the Hamden swung round for a couple of passes. The formation banked over and passed Holy Island, before travelling down the eastern side of England, and with most of the planes after eight hours in the air running on little more than fumes, they landed at RAF Acklington, 200 miles north of Scampton. One 49 Squadron aircraft ran out of fuel on approach and crashed into Acklington Church, while two others were shot down over Scotland by over-enthusiastic Spitfire pilots who mistook them for German Dornier 17s. This epic journey produced no results whatsoever, except to emphasise once again Bomber Command's poor navigational standards and general ineffectiveness. As Christmas 1939 approached, the weather closed in, hampering flying operations still further. 83 Squadron had been dispersed to RAF Ringway in Manchester, where the pilots had made the most of the social opportunities on offer in the local pubs and dance halls. Then, abruptly, they were ordered back to Scampton for more night flying training and nickel sorties. Five new pilots arrived. They were nervous and didn't know what to expect. They were all assigned as second pilots, 
meaning that the new boys were to act as navigators on a few operations before being given captaincy of their own Hamdens. Then the weather really turned, and it started to snow heavily. By New Year 1940, Scampton was buried under snow, its runways inundated, hangar doors blocked by giant drifts, and base supply made almost impossible as the country roads surrounding the airfield were closed. To compound the misery, the beer ran out in the officers' mess. With flying grounded, the air crews were given intensive lectures on navigation, armaments, etc., and plenty of parades and drill. Life on the station was, as Guy Gibson noted, unbearable. But while Scampton soldiered on under its white winter blanket at the Air Ministry in London, the kernel of a brilliant plan was being carefully nurtured. At Astral House, a handsome but rather grimy nine-storey Edwardian office block at the Aldwych end of Kingsway was the home of the Air Ministry. Snow covered the rooftops on either side of the street as one of the men tasked by the RAF with creating plans to attack Hitler's Germany headed to a very important meeting on a chill January morning. The gutters were piled up with dirty snow, and black cabs and red double-decker buses moved slowly along in the winter gloom, the sky a leaden grey. Thirty-eight-year-old Wing Commander Victor Bennett, muffled up in cap, leather gloves and a heavy greatcoat, descended the short flight of stone steps from the building's sandbagged entrance, where two airmen in steel helmets and webbing presented arms with their Lee Enfield rifles. Bennett touched the brim of his cap in salute, then walked across the pavement to where a young WAF driver stood holding open the door to a blue-grey painted Hillman Minx staff car, its engine idling at the curb. The WAF saluted as Bennett threw his briefcase onto the black leather back seat and slipped inside. The driver closed the door and climbed in behind the wheel. A few seconds later, the Hillman pulled into the slow-moving traffic, and Bennett settled in for the 90-minute drive. Bennett had joined the RAF in 1922, soon after its formation, and risen quickly through the ranks as a squadron pilot until promoted to wing commander and appointed to the Air Staff's Directorate of Plans in 1939. As deputy director, Bennett's days were long and arduous, and his small staff on the sixth floor was overworked by the sheer volume of material they had to collate and disseminate into workable operational plans for the various groups to enact. A slim, good-looking man, who sported a pencil-thin Errol Flynn moustache, a cleft chin, and a steady gaze, Bennett had soon discovered that targeting Germany was both extremely appealing, but also frustratingly difficult. While squadrons like 49 and 83 at Scampton continued to nibble at the German North Sea ports and shipping without much success, Wing Commander Bennett and members of the air staff had spent Christmas 1939 trawling through pre-war intelligence photos that had been surreptitiously snapped over western Germany by a flight of MI6-sponsored civilian aircraft. This top-secret operation had been one of the few instances when Britain had put resources into preparing for war, and the results had been impressive. What Bennett required was a target that, if destroyed, would severely hamper Hitler's war machine, a target so significant that its destruction or damage would force Germany to completely rethink its strategy in the West. It seemed a tall order. But Bennett had, in his opinion, found just such a target that was within range of Bomber Command aircraft based in eastern England. What Bennett and his team had identified were aqueducts M25 and M25A on the Dortmund Ems Canal. Now all Bennett had to do was sell the target to his superiors and have them order a strike that would take a razor to that most sensitive of Hitler's supply arteries. Working feverishly into New Year 1940, Bennett had put together a target appraisal and associated materials and requested a meeting with the then head of Bomber Command, Air Chief Marshal Sir Edgar Ludlow Hewitt. In early January, Bennett got the call he wanted. The meeting was on. Bomber Command's headquarters was at Walters Ash in Buckinghamshire, 
a series of reinforced concrete buildings cleverly disguised to look like a country estate in a quaint corner of English countryside near High Wycom. It was codenamed Southdown, and the Germans never discovered its significance. As the staff car wormed its way out of London and along country roads, Bennett carefully went over the plans inside his briefcase. He was about to outline a game-changer to Ludlow Hewitt, and he couldn't afford to make any mistakes. Before his meeting, Bennett had reached out to our man in Rotterdam, Douglas Tiger Child. Lieutenant Child was a rather unlikely spy. Age 37, Child was rather portly and unathletic, but under the cover of the British Consulate General's Shipping Central Office at Kalanstrat 28B, he gathered intelligence on behalf of the British Admiralty on all aspects of Dutch waterborne trade. A fluent Dutch speaker, Child held the unique position of having been a peacetime barge skipper on the Dutch and German canal systems, running a highly profitable business that had offered yacht holidays on the canals to British tourists. Already on the reserve list from 1936, when war broke out, Child had been commissioned a temporary lieutenant in the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve, and served as a navigator on board an armed trawler on the British coast, before the powers that be realised his unique value and packed him off to Rotterdam under a diplomatic passport. No Englishman knew the Dortmund Ems Canal and its potential weaknesses better than Tiger Child. It was imperative that Wing Commander Bennett explore all possible ways to shut down the canal, with the views of a former skipper familiar with this waterway would prove invaluable. Bennett called Child in Rotterdam over a secure line. Child was quick to point out that one of the best ways to block the canal was to sink one of the barges that constantly plied their trade along it. A tug tows four barges, Child said, one behind the other, the average size of a barge is 400 tons. They may tow as many as six. Loaded barges travelled well down in the water, the surface just lapping the top of the middle of the vessel. Speed was about four miles per hour. The cold, hard figures demonstrated just how important the Dortmund Ems Canal was to the Germans. In 1939, a total of 17,094 vessels had traversed it, including 5,750 under their own power, with the remainder under tow. The total traffic equated to almost 9.7 million tonnes. Throughout 1940, that total could only rise as German war production increased. One important point to note, sir, Lieutenant Charles continued, the barges on the Dortmund Ems Canal are made of steel, without watertight bulkheads, unlike those on the Rhine. Hole one, and she's going down. A large barge sunk in the canal would almost certainly obstruct traffic in both directions. Bennett was intrigued. For how long, he asked. Well, sir, I've seen a 700-ton coal barge cleared in under an hour, Child replied, but that was in a harbour where the necessary appliances were ready. It would take at least uh, 48 hours to clear a big barge from a canal. Bennett was making rough notes on a pad as he listened, the receiver pressed to his ear. Two days wasn't much of a delay. He asked Child about other targets on the canal. Child suggested that the RAF look at lock gates. The Dortmund Ems Canal had 19 locks used to raise and lower tugs and barges up and down a few feet to the next section of the waterway. The smallest was 219 feet long by 8.6 feet wide. The gates are mostly oak of about 8 inches thick, and the more modern ones are of steel, Child said, but he added helpfully, I think it unlikely that the Germans have any spare gates available. Child then went further, suggesting a way in which a set of gates might be wrecked. Take a thousand pounds of TNT and pack it aboard a motorboat moored alongside a gate, Child stated. The resulting damage would close the canal for several days until repairs could be effected. But again, such a delay would only be temporary and almost not worth the effort. Bennett and Child chatted some more, leaving Bennett with plenty to think about. Interestingly, Lieutenant Child mentioned the twin aqueducts, M25 and M25A. 
Whichever way Bennett looked at the problem, his mind kept drifting back to the only seemingly sure-fire target that, if destroyed, promised to do more than merely slightly inconvenience the Germans, but to put a serious dent in Hitler's plans. Bennett decided to concentrate his department's planning on the aqueducts, though he would take other targets into consideration as well. He asked Child to send him as much material as he could find on the canal via the diplomatic bag before ringing off. When Wing Commander Bennett's car arrived at Bomber Command's headquarters at Southdown, he was directed immediately to Air Chief Marshal Ludlow Hewitt's office. After exchanging pleasantries, the two men got straight down to business. The Germans use three main canals to move their supplies, sir, Bennett said, opening a large map of northern Germany on a table in the middle of the room. The head of Bomber Command's office was spacious, a low fire burning in the grate. Ludlow Hewitt had led Bomber Command since September 1937 a tall, spare man of fifty-three, with the demeanour of a public school headmaster. The grey-haired Ludlow Hewitt bent over Bennett's map, putting on a pair of reading spectacles. He was a man of minute and detailed knowledge of every aspect of his job. Bomber Harris, then commanding Five Group, would write later of Ludlow Hewitt. He was far and away the most brilliant officer I have ever met in any of the three services. Placing a plan before such a man was both intimidating and thrilling in equal measure. Bennett, who now felt ready to outline the basics of his mission idea to Ludlow Hewitt, had only requested the meeting following several weeks of careful work. How much are we talking about, Bennett? Ludlow Hewitt asked, referring to German trade on their canals. Forty-three per cent of all trade, sir, Bennett replied. It was an astounding figure, almost half of Hitler's most vital material resources travelling along just three sinewy canals in northern Germany. The most important is the Dortmund-Ems Canal, sir, Bennett said, running his index finger along its length, picked out in red crayon on the map. The thing is 167 miles long and runs from Dortmund here to the sea at Emden here. It's the main artery for the carriage of heavy bulk goods to and from the Ruhr. Ludlow Hewitt grunted, folding his arms across his chest as he listened. The Ruhr was the industrial heartland in northern Germany where most of Hitler's weapons were manufactured, a vast series of towns and cities crammed with factories, mines, industrial plants and power stations. A permanent haze of pollution hung over the region as the Nazis' mighty war machine was created and sustained by millions of workers labouring like ants in a multitude of enterprises, making aircraft, tanks, firearms, helmets, boots, bullets, in fact almost everything to keep the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe as the most efficient, well-equipped and feared military forces in the world. This was to be the epicentre of the RAF's effort to stop the Germans. At night, its many furnaces and smelting plants glowed eerily through the thick grey air, a sulphurous lair that equipped Hitler's legions on their seemingly irresistible march across the continent of Europe. And at the centre of it all, the Dortmund-Ems Canal threading its way like a stitched seam holding the whole evil enterprise together. Tune in again for the next thrilling chapter of The Bridge Busters. If you can't wait that long, paperback and Kindle versions are available. See the link in the description box below. You have been listening to The Bridge Busters, written and narrated by Mark Felton on War Stories with Mark Felton. For great documentary films on many military subjects, visit the YouTube channel Mark Felton Productions. Hit the subscribe buttons for both channels to make sure you don't miss any of the action.